Hey everyone, I think we're recording now. Uh, welcome to this lecture, which as you can tell is going to be on the Persian period. Um, if you've been following along with uh, Gowan's book, you'll know that um, he titles this, this particular chapter uh, a, a, a resurrection. This is one of the resurrection chapters. Gowan's book is divided into um, kind of chapters that deal with death and then those that deal with resurrection. And, um, and so in this case, I thought we're chronologically, we're kind of moving into a new period of time. The, the previous two weeks on um, Ezekiel and Jeremiah have really dealt with um, kind of the pre and exilic periods, or maybe better language is um, uh, the period leading up to uh, the Babylonian conquest of Judah, and then the um, and then the period in which Israel or Judah, I should say, is in exile. And so um, we're now entering into kind of a new uh, a new moment in Judah's history, and it's generally called the Persian period. There are some other names for it. Uh, some people call it the post-exilic period. I really don't like that, to be honest, because I think it's really imprecise. Um, if we understand exile to be the uh, kind of the, the displacement of Jews from the Holy Land, one would have to say that that continues, of course, even into today and doesn't only encompass um, kind of the uh, years, you know, like what we typically call the Persian period or the, and the Hellenistic periods. The, the sort of post-exilic period is just far too imprecise, I think. And, and similarly with... Um, uh, and so, so I think the kind of the, the language of Persian period is probably a better for us because it also allows us to s distinguish between um, the Persian period and then the later Hellenistic period. And so um, we're kind of by using Persian period, we're kind of continuing in the tradition of naming historical periods after the empires that are dominant in place. And so the previous uh, historical period, something you could call it um, uh, sort of the Babylonian era or and then prior to that the Assyrian period again to kind of mark um, to mark those periods of time to mark uh, periods of time uh, by means of kind of the dominating powers of the day and so we're going to do that with the Persian period and it, and it, when I when we talk about the Persian period we're basically talking about 539 up to 332 and so let's actually look at that in light of the broader uh, history of Israel and let me back up before we get into this for just a second to say that really the goal of this lecture is to give you kind of an introduction to it's a period that I feel like is is a little bit obscure, especially in in kind of church circles, but but also in seminary circles where people generally know about the exilic period, or they might know about um, the years of the monarchy, the monarchic years, maybe beginning you know beginning with uh, Saul, on up to um, on up to the final days of Judah in the exilic period, and and folks are generally aware of those things, but the Persian period I feel like is a bit of a mystery to many students, but it's it's really important because it's probably one of the most, if not the most productive periods in Jewish history. And I mean, when I say productive, I'm talking about from a kind of a literary perspective, that so many of the books of the Bible were either written during that period or significantly edited during that period. And as a result, were influenced by some really important events in that time. And so uh, in my opinion, it's important you don't have to become Persian period, right, Achaemenid historians, right? Um, but but what, I, what I do want you to know is have some grasp of how important this period is, that these years kind of from the fall of the Second Temple up to the time of Jesus aren't just sort of um, intertestamental or aren't just sort of like transitional periods kind of leading up to Jesus, but in fact, the Old Testament is deeply formed in this period of time, and there is a a significant Persian and Hellenistic stamp left on the Hebrew Bible uh, during these periods. And so I thought it was a little bit, I thought it was important that we just kind of take this lecture to, excuse me, that we take this lecture to uh, orient ourselves to that particular historical period because I think we also, we're also going to see in this time that. Um, there were some really significant shifts in theology, in Israelite theology that will have major 
impact on uh, later Christian theology. So um, here's just kind of an outline. Those of you who have taken my classes before will probably recognize this, but this is kind of an historical outline of, um, of Israelite history, beginning with kind of the, the very earliest emergence of, a, of this kind of distinct Semitic language speaking people that the Bible calls Israel. And so we first get reference to this extra biblically uh, around 1200 BCE. And then we'll just move quickly through this early stuff. The emergence of the monarchy, you know, 1000 to 900. So here we're talking about Saul, David, uh, Shlomo, um, the destruction of the northern kingdom by the Assyrians, 722, 721. Um, and here, this is, I mean, this is, of course, a very important moment of exile as well, because it's a moment when the northern tribes of Israel are exiled and effectively uh, swallowed up by history, right? We really don't know what happened to them. I mean, we know that they were kind of deported to different parts of the Assyrian Empire, but what kind of happened to that cohesive group of people is really unclear um, to historians. And so uh, then we have Sennacherib's uh, destruction of Lachish and his laying a siege of Jerusalem, all Assyrian. The reforms of Josiah all taking place under the Assyrian rule. But then we have a, a switch in power, right? And, and often periodization is done according to shifts in who is the dominant power. And there are both um, benefits and, and you know, positives and negatives to doing it this way. I think it's, I think it's, uh, it's convenient uh, historically. And so we'll kind of go, go with it. We have the kind of the beginning of... Um, uh, uh, beginning of the Babylonian period in the late 7th century, around 609. And uh, it, one result of that, one result, one consequence of that transition from Assyria to Babylon, which from the perspective of a Mesopotamian inhabitant is a transition from a northern ruling power to a southern ruling power, south in Babylon meaning, um, uh, this had the transition of of power to Babylon to Babel, uh, to the Babylonian kings was very consequential for Judah uh, because as a result of that transition the Babylonian kings Nebuchadnezzar in particular um, laid siege to Jerusalem and uh, it, you know taxes it with tribute and eventually will destroy its most kind of important societal institutions and will also deport many of its elites. Right, that's another way of kind of keeping a people under subjugation is by removing its intellectual class or its quote unquote elite class. Now, uh, no Babylon, no uh, empire lives forever, and that was true for Babylon as well. Um, around 539, 538, the Babylonian Empire falls to the Persian Empire, and the Persian Empire is. Uh, inhabits basically the land that we call modern-day Iran. And so what do they speak in Iran, in modern-day Iran? They speak Farsi, right? Think about those words, F-R-S, the same consonants that appear in uh, P, uh, Persia, P-R-S. It's, it's a related word. And so Farsi is uh, effectively Persian, right? And so uh, the modern Farsi is related to old Persian. And, um, and in any case, so the Persians overthrow the Babylonian Empire, and this breaks open a whole new chapter in uh, Israelite history. Let's, let me continue with the outline and then move on to some of the major events and consequences. Okay, as a result, now, under Persian rule, in particular under the the uh, under the rule of a man named Koresh, uh, Cyrus is how we say it in English, but Koresh is how they say it in Hebrew. Um, s many exiles were permitted to return to Jerusalem, and what's more, Koresh allows uh, underwrites, in fact, the reconstruction and dedication of the Second Temple. So remember, uh, the Babylonians, of course, destroyed the Second Temple. Right, and the, the temple is, um, especially from the time of Josiah, beginning of the time of Josiah, the central place for all of all Israelites to come and do their uh, and do their worship. That is destroyed, causing uh, havoc, right, and, and and causing many problems, both theological and sociological, among the people of Judah. Um, so. The Persian Empire and uh, the Persian Empire in particular allows it, it, it tends to be remembered in a more benevolent way, in part because it allows for the return of some exiles 
uh, to Yehud, the, the area um, kind of centered in Jerusalem and its surrounding environs in the Persian period is called Yehud. Um, and so the Persians allow for some exiles to return and allow also for the recreation of the temple, which is a very, very significant thing. The Persian period basically ends with Alexander the Great. Again, kind of keeping with the tradition of doing periodization by great power. And uh, so the um, Persian period ends around 332 BCE when Alexander the Great conquers Palestine. We won't go into this other stuff because this is all what we call the Hellenistic period. Again, naming things after what the dominant cultures are. But I highlighted here in bold the years that we will be focused on. Effectively about 200 years. And these 200 years proved to be amazingly fruitful. Uh, for Jewish literature and for Jewish theology and for Jewish history. It is a remarkable period of time for all things uh, Jewish. So here we go. Let me begin by talking a bit about um, literary productivity. The Persian period was a time of profound literary productivity. Um, now, many of the, while many of the biblical books underwent significant editing during the Persian periods, the, I should say following. The following biblical books were are commonly associated. Actually, let me fix this really quickly. I think I forgot to complete my edit here. Um, so this is all right. The Persian period is a time of profound literary pro productivity. And then I don't need a while here. Many biblical books underwent significant editing during the Persian periods. But, there we go, the following biblical books or literary blocks are commonly associated exclusively as it, they, they are written during the Persian period. And so, let me just be really clear about this. Many, many books in the Bible, Genesis, you know, or the Pentateuch, let me put it that way, uh, that the uh, uh, books like Joshua, Kings, all of these books were probably edited during the Persian period in some way or another. I don't think they're, they were written during that period, but they underwent some significant editing during the Persian period. Here, let's go into presentation mode. Okay, good. But there are also some books that are actually written during that, seem to be written during that period, and which address specifically kind of historical issues at that time. And those include Isaiah 40 through 55, 56 through 56, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Joel, maybe, uh, Esther, Ezra, Nehemiah, 1st and 2nd Chronicles. Now, Esther, Ezra, Nehemiah, and 1st and 2nd Chronicles are all kind of, they're very unique in that they explicitly um, deal with kind of the history or the time of the Persian Empire. So Esther, of course, is, the, is a Persian queen. Um, Ezra and Nehemiah deal with this period of time after uh, uh, Cyrus has allowed exiles to return and has un is underwriting the reconstruction of the temple. First and Second Chronicles, First and Second Chronicles is really a rewriting of First and Second Kings. Uh, I'm sorry, of Samuel Kings, um, and so the kind of regnal history, right? The history of Israel's kings. First and Second Chronicles. Um, I mean, let me let me put it in even slightly different terms. In some ways, First and Second Chronicles is a rewriting of the of, of the Neotuch, which is what scholars refer to as Genesis through Second Kings, right? Basically, creation to exile. First, First and Second Chronicles have a similar scope. They begin with the first couple, and then they end with the decree of Cyrus that the exiles may return. So First and Second Chronicles has a very similar scope to Samuel Kings, meaning they're covering the whole regnal period. Uh, they're going to cover on up to the exile, and in the case of First and Second Chronicles, actually cover beyond the exile to include return. We're going to read a little bit from first and second or from second chronicles in just a minute, but I wanted to give you some sense of how productive this period was. Uh, and that's not accidental, right? Crisis, historically crises often pr are often proved to be of course, crises and tragic, but also profoundly generative of literature. I think in particular about um, the day after 9/11 and the amount of poetry that was created in New York City alone. Um, I think it was the New York Times actually did a kind of photojournalistic uh, um, publication, a book, where they went around and, and I think they photographed and then also um, republished poems that were posted around the city 
in light of 9-11. And it's very, very powerful, but it, it's just another example of how crisis often is the womb of uh, human creativity. And, and, and that was certainly true for Israel as well in, in the Persian period. So all these books or sections of books were written during that time. We are 43, we are going to, whoops, where is happening here? Um, now you might be wondering, you say, okay, well, if that's really true, then why are we only reading these minor prophetic books and why aren't we reading Isaiah 40 through 66? You will be <laughs> very soon. In fact, in next week, um, the way we designed this class is that uh, we would do, um, the, the, the last couple weeks of class will actually be dedicated to a single prophetic book. It gives us a chance to dig a little bit deeper into that book. That book will be Isaiah. And so each of the next weeks will be dedicated to a section of Isaiah. And the last two, <clears throat> excuse me, literary blocks in Isaiah uh, were written um, primarily or significant parts of them were written during the Persian period and deal specifically with Persian period events and even people and themes. And so uh, just keep that in mind. And then, like I said, Esther, Ezra, Nehemiah, First and Chronicles, these are non-poetic books. They're narrative books. Um, that uh, deal explicitly with Persian period people, events, and, and, and things. So here's, there are four, what I called here, formative events in the Persian period or the Second Temple period or, or post-exilic period. These terms are variously used to describe the Persian period. I do not prefer either of these. I've already talked a bit about post-exilic. I, I have a problem with Second Temple period too. I think it uh, it's just it's insufficiently imprecise, right? This, this would cover presumably everything from the dedication of the Second Temple in 515 all the way up to its destruction in 70. It, it is just really imprecise. I think it's much better just to refer to this as the Persian period, but I include these other terms like Second Temple and post-exilic just so that you know that when these terms are used, they are often inclusive of the Persian period. So just just a little a, a little tidbit there. Now uh, we're going to look at some text here in a minute. Here's the first, what I think one of the most significant, excuse me, events in Jewish history, and that is the decree of Cyrus in 536 BCE. What does he decree? That the Jews may return to their land. And so this is obviously thought of as a kind of moment of fulfillment, right? Because this is what the prophets, many of the prophets were saying, that there would come a time of return. That time of return comes under the t uh, during the time of Cyrus and, in fact, under his supervision. Let's look at a couple texts here. We'll actually just look at the Second Chronicles 36 one because it's basically just... Uh, it's basically saying the same thing in Ezra 1. So let's go Second Chronicles 36... Okay, there we go. The people of the land took Jehoahaz, son of Josiah, and made him king to succeed his father in Jerusalem. Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he began to reign. He reigned three months in Jerusalem. Uh, you know what, actually, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Okay. So what's, what's being described up to this point is really that moment of exile, the moment of deportation, and the moment, as you can see here in verse, uh, verse 19, the burning of the house of the Lord, really the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, that's basically where 2 Kings ends, is with the destruction of Jerusalem and the deportation of its leaders and elites. Now, 2 Chronicles is going to add something very significant. Let's see. Verse 21. Um, whoops, I'm sorry, yeah, verse 22. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, and this is a very interesting moment where Jeremiah is actually referenced explicitly and where his prophecy, of, seems to be his prophecy of 70 years um, is, is referenced here. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, in fulfillment of the word of the, of the, word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, King Cyrus of Persia, so that he sent a herald throughout all his kingdom and also declared in a written edict. So just let me pause for a second. Notice here that the close connection that the text makes between 
the action, the imperialistic actions of King Cyrus and the stirring of the Lord, right? The, we've seen this time and time again that these biblical texts do not hesitate to see, to interpret God's divine action in and behind human uh Actions and even imperial actions, as we see right here. Thus says Cyrus, King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you, all of his people, may the Lord his God be with him. Let him go up. And boom, that's where Second Chronicles ends. And what's interesting is that, so, so it ends with King Cyrus declaring that they may go back, that the Jews may go back. Um, he gives them the royal decree to go build the house of Jerusalem. Now, now we can look at this theologically the way that Chronicles does. There's also good cause to think about it economically because the temple will also become kind of the center of commerce and the way, the mean, kind of the institution through which the Persian Empire will extract uh, uh, payments and tribute, etc. But in any case, that's not uh, Second Chronicles 36 does not interpret these events in that way. Um, but so Cyrus says, God has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem in Judah. And so, and then he says, whoever among you, this people may go and may the Lord be with them. And so this, this is like this amazing moment of return. It's probably not accidental. And it is very interesting that the Jewish Bible ends not only with second Chronicles, but with this precise verse, right? It leans toward a future of homecoming. Um, whereas the, the Protestant Bible very differently begins with Malachi uh, with a prophecy that kind of leans toward the return of Eliyahu, uh, the return of Elijah. And so canonically, it's interesting to see, you know, that the Jewish canon ends in this way with 2 Chronicles 36. In fact, with the very verse that we're looking at, um, the Protestant Bible and, and, and the Jewish Bible ending with, a, with, with hope for return and for the reconstruction of the temple. Uh, the Protestant Bible ends with uh, a kind of expectation for the coming of Elijah. So super interesting stuff, uh, canonically speaking. But let me go back here. <clears throat> okay, so that's the first event is, okay, in contrast to Nebuchadnezzar, who deports, right, tons of people, destroys the temple, Cyrus is in many ways kind of the anti-Nebuchadnezzar in that he will allow them to return and will also help to rebuild the temple. Now, we can interpret that cynically, and that's totally appropriate. But for in the case of 2 Chronicles 36, Ezra 1, this is interpreted as God's action. This is God's deliverance. And in fact, it, it, it's this... The deliverance aspect of it is made very explicit in Isaiah 45, which I'm going to right now. Ko amar Adonai lim shicho lekoresh. This is an amazing line. Thus said Adonai to or about probably. Um, well, no, no, I'm sorry. It's a, it, it's, it should be to. I, I like the translation here. To his anointed, to Cyrus. The word here for anointed is Messiah. <laughs> uh, Mashiach. And... Lim uh, Shicho is the is the exact uh, form here. So Cyrus is interpreted by Second Isaiah not only favorably, not only as God's instrument, but as God's anointed Messiah. It, it's just stunning, right? Let's read the rest of it. So what does God say? Lim Shicho lechoresh. He said, whose right hand I have grasped. That, that, that's a kind of a common, the, the image of a god grasping the hand of a ruler is actually really, is present in quite a few uh, ancient Near Eastern imperialist art forms where uh, the deity kind of grabs onto the hand of the ruler to show that, you know, the god favors that ruler. Okay, um, and what is he saying to Koresh? Uh, to subdue nations before him, to strip kings of their robes, to open doors before him, and the gates shall not be closed. As I, I will go before you and level the mountains, I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, excuse me, I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I surname you, though you do not know me. Um, I am the Lord, and there is no other beside me. There is no God. I am 
I, I arm you though you don't know me, so that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Okay, let's just uh, keep, uh, let's just go from there. So again, uh, Cyrus is called the Messiah. He is, his power and his rule, even his violence is supported by Yahweh, enabled by Yahweh. Um, and uh, it is all, you can interpret it this way, all for the sake of this, so that you may know that it is I, the Lord your God, the God of Israel. It is for the sake of, of Jacob, for Israel, his chosen one. So God chooses Cyrus uh, to do good on behalf of uh, of God's servant, uh, of God's servant Jacob. So you can see the, you know, it's interesting to kind of compare the. Um, remarkably positive language for Cyrus here in Isaiah with, say, the predominant language for Nebuchadnezzar in, um, you know, I think about uh, parts of Jeremiah, I think about um, uh, uh, some of the parts of Isaiah as well, where uh, other parts of Isaiah as well, where uh, Nebuchadnezzar is really not thought of in positive terms at all, even though it's understood that he's God's instrument. Here, Cyrus it kind, of, it kind of gets taken to a whole different level where Cyrus is really understood to be God's anointed Messiah, which is absolutely stunning, right? Okay. The second part, the formative event, is the dedication of the second temple in 515. This is significant simply be, for many reasons, but essentially because this allows for the reestablishment of proper Judahite worship at the temple in Jerusalem. This dedication comes a little bit later than the decree itself, but around 515 BCE. Um, you can read a lot of... Ezra and Nehemiah both contain kind of reflections and retellings uh, of this. Whew, sorry, I had a bug fly into my glasses. Of this particular period of time. But it's just significant in larger Jewish history because the dedication of the temple is kind of the reestablishment of normative worship. And so it allows for um, Judah to gather around those temple practices and to grab or g gather around those uh, worship practices. So that's another significant event in the Persian period. Also significant is the fact that it's underwritten by the Persians, right? Now they, of course, uh, being wise bureaucrats, know that there's going to be funding flowing from that second temple and that the second temple can actually serve as a kind of economic center. Uh, thirdly, there seems to be significant tension between those those who were left in the land, I say remained in the land here, but probably not by their own choice, but those who were abandoned to the land or left in the land, and then those who returned. It's also important to remember that those who were initially exiled, the later returnees, tended to be the most educated and the most privileged type in their society. And so when those people head off to Babylon, uh, spend time there, start families, perhaps receive an education, uh, they then go back to Yehud and realize that the people who were left there were not the upper crust of society, right? And so there were significant tensions felt between those people. You can see those tensions, especially in the third section of Isaiah 56 through 66. So it's important to remember that despite all the uh, kind of remarkable language about Cyrus and celebratory language about the work that he will do, there remain significant tensions, especially between those who are returning, and those who remain in, uh, in the land. Uh, and then the final point here is the Persian period, and maybe a bit within the, the Babylon, Neo-Babylonian period as well, is really the time in which monotheism seems to develop in Israel. In the time leading up to the development of monotheism, and I'm sure this, some of, a lot of this lingers on beyond the Persian period, um, Israel seems to be henotheistic, meaning that they believe that there, there is one God, that this God is probably supreme, that his God is supreme over the other gods, but that there are other gods. This is called henotheism, but the Yahweh is sort of king of kings, right? And uh, But it's within the Persian period that you start to see these strong developments toward monotheism, meaning one God to the exclusion of others, not one alongside others, but one God and no others, okay? So it's an important period of time in which monotheism develops and grows uh, in this um, Persian period. So that's basically everything, friends. I, I didn't want to go too in-depth into specific texts, but I wanted you to have some sense of uh, kind of 
uh, the historical weight of this period, how important it is for the biblical text, our biblical text, the, the Old Testament side at least, would be significantly shorter and significantly poorer from kind of a, a, a theological perspective if we were lacking the literature from this period of time. The Persian period is so important. I encourage you to dig into it. In fact, I think Dr. Cameron Howard may teach a class on the Persian period or maybe on some of the books on the Persian period like um, I think maybe Ezra and Nehemiah. I can't remember. It's been a couple years. But I think that Dr. Howard, I know that her dissertation dealt with this period and so she's quite an expert in it. But um, all this to say, I wanted you to have some kind of orienting conversation about the Persian period and, and hopefully to spark some of your curiosity in this period because from my perspective and from the perspective of kind of the composition of the Bible, I think the Persian period is one of the most, if not the most important important period, or at least most productive period in time in Israelite history. Uh, so in any case, I hope all that's helpful for you. If you have any questions at all, let me know. Otherwise, have a great day. Thanks.